In those days, there was no king. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Judges 21, 25. This may be a weird way to start this video, but whenever I think of the concept of anarchy, I immediately think of Mr. Rogers and his neighborhood. Consequently, Mr. Rogers is also who I think about when I think about the man I strive to be and the manner in which I strive to love others, to love all. Sure, I've been told it's unrealistic, and as a result, unachievable. I've been told that it's an ideal that isn't actually possible for us incomplete, errant fools of humanity. But I consider myself sort of an expert when it comes to dreaming impossible dreams. And since when have I let the unreachable star stop me from nevertheless reaching for it? I have always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you, so... Seriously, one of the greatest compliments I ever received was in a student evaluation of a college course I was teaching where they actually put on the very bureaucratic form that my department chair, the division dean, at all could read saying, quote, Reverend Compost is Mr. Rogers. If Mr. Rogers looked like he smoked meth and rode a motorcycle. If there was one term I would use to summarize both the concept of anarchy and the ideal of Christianity, it would be love. But I should probably back up a bit because that may be getting way too ahead of myself. Within the title of this video is a question, or two questions depending on what I end up titling it. Can an anarchist be a Christian? Can a Christian be an anarchist? My answer to both, yes. However, there is obviously more to it than just a straightforward answer, even if I did spoil it with that whole love summation business. Furthermore, did you notice that I am asking the question can, as in, is there an ability to do so? I did not ask the question should, as in, is there a moral precedent to do so? This leads me to the intent of all of this. See, my goal here is to provide an alternate perspective, not just for Christians wondering what the Bible actually says and teaches about just how they're supposed to engage with the world, particularly politically with the government, but also to anarchists who hold that their anarcho beliefs are not at all compatible with religion, especially Christianity. And while I do believe that the Christian concept of the eschatos kingdom of heaven lived out here on earth works as the perfect framework for what's missing from the anarchist community, and further, the anarchist mindset is the perfect framework for what is to be Christ's followers, ultimately my goal and desire remains to reveal how living a life of radical love acts as the most revolutionary and affectatious method for bringing about real and genuine change in the world. As I said, I believe the core philosophy united both Christianity and anarchy is, or at least ought to be, radical, revolutionary love. Now, before I begin, I must make note that there are plenty of books and materials out there for you to peruse over and really sink your teeth into. I'm going to be mentioning a few of those texts and books and writings and name dropping a few thinkers and philosophers, all as they relate to the themes I'm talking about. I just have no desire to explain each text or author or thinker, so I simply encourage you to seek these texts out on your own and read through them yourselves. With that all out of the way, let's begin part one. No gods, no masters. Here's the thing. I don't know what you kids are up to, but I do know one thing. Laws are threats made by the dominant socioeconomic ethnic group in a given nation. It's just a promise of violence that's enacted and police are basically an occupying army. You know what I mean? I'm not gonna bury the lead here because I'm sure if you have just the most minimal awareness of both Christianity and anarchy, you'd ask how they could ever have any compatibility together. And so we need to first address what I think to be the two 
common misconceptions of what anarchy is. For one, anarchy is not a monolith. It's a very broad church with many different forms to it. I'm particularly interested in those forms that take a more community and connective approach. Point being, because it is not a singular idea universally agreed upon, there are many different ways to approach anarchism and anarchistic thought, and I believe that because of this, there is an approach which not only welcomes Christianity into the fold, but that Christianity could actually serve as a guide in anarchistic thought movements. The second misconception is that anarchy means lawlessness. That anarchy is just pure chaos. No gods, no masters, be gay, do crime. No, that's called barbarism. Well, the first part is. The absence of culture and civilization, extreme cruelty and brutality is barbarism. I cannot stress this enough. If we're going to talk about what anarchy is, well, get it in your heads and make sure it sticks. Anarchism does not equate, meaning it is not equal to, barbarism. Anarchy is, simply stated in a political sense, a belief system that holds there is no justification for government as an entity. In order to understand where I'm going with this, I'm going to state in the briefest of summaries that generally, the two main explanations for the justification for government, for a social contract theory, if you will, is that humanity is inherently wicked, or humanity isn't. What is humanity like in the state of nature? What is humanity like in the state of existence without any government or any law? When asking those questions, government then is either a necessary tool to keep our wicked instincts in check, or it's an aid to help us better ourselves, collectively, or individually, or both. I'm happy to elaborate on the justification for government, social contract theory, the state of nature, and the rest, but not here in this video. I'm only wanting to briefly touch on them to get to my actual point on anarchy. So, really simply, think of it this way. To those that believe in the justification for government, they see it either as a parent or an assistant. Government is necessary either to enforce regulations and laws, like a parent, or to better aid us, like an assistant. And this is the first issue we have to clarify. Anarchy derives from the Greek meaning anti-hierarchy. A as in antithesis, and then archi as in hierarchy. Think of it like atheist versus theist, right? An atheist is lacking the theism. Now this could be anti as in against, or it could be anti as in lacking, not containing. Again, like an atheist, someone could simply not hold those theistic beliefs, or they could be anti-theistic beliefs. Either way, it's the antithesis of the statement. Or it could be a blend of both. To be an anarchist could be that you don't believe in hierarchies. It could be that you stand opposed to them, or could be both. So why do we correlate anarchy now with anti-government? How do we square that circle of anti-hierarchy to anti-government? Or is there some way that any and all forms of government equal hierarchy? Well... The first question you've got to ask is not only how much power you have, but just what is the distribution of power among the people. And yet, it isn't just a question about power. It's a question about freedom, which is something of a concept I know we as Americans all love. My freedom! But how much freedom do you have, and is there a distribution of freedom such that some 
have more freedom than others? Well, first, I've got to clarify. There is a difference between negative freedom and positive freedom. In the government of the United States, something like the Second Amendment means you are not restricted. The government cannot restrict you from buying and owning a gun. But if you don't have the money, the access, or the means to buy and own a gun, well then, does that lack of restriction actually translate to freedom? You're allowed to buy a gun, but if you don't have the ability to do so, are you actually free to do so? And I know, talking about these things like unequal freedom is something that is already heavy and may require a lot of just not only introspection, but a lot of possibly critically thinking about the country you live in. The first question though is when the notions of freedom and power are equated to ability, well then, is there an unequal distribution of ability amongst the people? And please don't just knee-jerk and say no. And that leads us into the second paradox of government control. Does its very existence, the existence of government as an entity, dictate to the people how they can be free? Dr. Sophie Scott Brown says it brilliantly when describing anarchist thought that we all know that you can't be forced to be free. But what I could do instead is ask, well, in any given situation, how might you increase the amount of freedom ability that's available to you? Here's where I would follow up and make my point. How free are you? to increase the amount of freedom that's available to you. How able, truly, are you to increase the amount of ability that's available to you? Now, because I'm afraid of being accused of taking Dr. Sophie Scott Brown's quote out of context, I do want to address that the interview which I pulled the quote from, she's talking a very practical means of applying anarchistic thought into action, blending the ideal end and the means to achieve that end all in one. I don't dismiss this at all, and in fact believe there to be a real question to wrestle with in a very George Berkeley, Cervantes, idealism sort of way, where we're not ignoring the reality in favor of the dream, but instead living pragmatically, understanding idealism as a belief in a larger reality that includes this one not a reality to escape to when things aren't the way you believe they should be. As the Christian dogma puts it, to live in the world, but not of the world. Nevertheless, how free are you to increase the amount of freedom that's available to you? How able are you to increase the amount of ability that's available to you? And if there's a limitation, who is responsible for that limitation? And again, please don't knee-jerk, just simply react and say, only you! Because I could very easily get into the studies that show that the United States is neither a republic, nor is it a democracy, but instead, it's a corporate oligarchy. Corporations have all the power. But rather than get into those studies, I'll simply leave them in the description below. At a certain point, though, there comes the realization that no matter the government imposed, all government as an entity is inherently hierarchical in the power, freedom, and ability distributed. And when it truly comes down to it, there is an argument that all government as an entity, all government truly is, is a means of enforcing that hierarchy of power freedom, and ability. And that justification for government always comes by force and not consent. And so the critique of government as an entity is one not just saying that there is no justification for government as an entity, but one saying that government itself exists as a means of force and coercion, not of consent. And the question comes back to what I said before. 
How free are you to make choices, any and all choices, when you are forced to make those choices? How free are you to choose to follow a law, any law, when you're threatened with what will happen if you don't? Isn't there that whole defense of, I feared for my life, as a justification for wrong action? Well, if that's an understandable defense under the grounds that you had no choice, well then if you are forced, you have no choice. The anarchist will generally say that all government is force, and in force, coercion, there is no freedom. Furthermore, Think back to what I said about those that believe in the justification for government. They see it either as a parent or an assistant. Well, do you necessarily always need either of those two? Are you free when you're entirely dependent on either of those two? Don't you think that you outgrow that need? To be truly independent is to require neither a parent or an assistant. And in this way, Anarchy is uh, progressive in its thought, as in progress past the need for government. In this way, the ideal of anarchism is one in which you are truly free to make your own choices, and whatever you choose, you freely consent to following. Anarchy is the difference between coercion and consent. And this is where I circle back to Mr. Rogers, Comrade Rogers, and love. You see, love... True love... True love, you heard him? True love is entirely consensual. If there is any coercion, any force in love, well, then I think we would hopefully all agree that it isn't true love. And yet, true love is limiting. You are limited in your freedoms when you are in love. You limit yourself. You limit your freedom. You sacrifice, endure hardship, suffering, all manner of pain for your love. Entering into a relationship requires you to surrender certain liberties of yours. But you choose that. You consent. There is still a contract of sorts involved, but it's not one forced upon you from birth even sometimes. What do you willingly endure pain, suffering, discomfort for? And would you do it for love? Do you consent to feel those things? Love is the ultimate anarchy. See, there is no hierarchy in love. And if there is, that's an unhealthy, possibly abusive relationship. My son, just this week, just this week upon recording this, has begun to say, I love you too, back to me whenever I say I love you. See, for the longest time, in a very classic nine-year-old boy way, every time I said, I love you, kiddo, or I love you, son, he'd respond with, okay, now, Imagine if I made him say it back. You have to say I love you back! Or, imagine if I made both my children recite, say, an oath of fealty to me every morning. Is that love, or is that starting to sound cultish, right? See, the love itself is the oath. I don't need him to say it back. He knows my love for him, and I know his love for me. I don't need them to say it to me every morning. Because if I did, that comes across as indoctrination. Which again, sounds pretty cultish to me, but uh... Maybe it's okay when it's not called an oath of fealty, and instead it's called, I don't know, off the top of my head, like say something like a pledge of allegiance. If it's in any way forced, is it actually freedom? And if it's forced, how do you know they actually mean it? If you're afraid of what will happen if you don't do something, can you really say you don't want to do it? Are you really free to not do it? 
If you're afraid of hell to pay, how free are you in love? There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Part two. If everyone is special, then no one is. And when everyone's super, <laughs> no one will be. Have you ever heard that phrase, if everyone is special, then no one is, or something like it? The Incredibles, right? The villain, Syndrome. The Incredibles is a very Ayn Randian, egoist doctrine of a film. And when you watch it through the lens of somebody that really loves Ayn Rand, you begin to see all the bits that support Ayn Rand's philosophy. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. If everyone is special, then no one is. That's a great phrase to combat equality. Great phrase to undermine human value. An incredibly great phrase to maintain a hierarchy. Maybe of human value, of human worth. See, there are sharks and there are minnows. And most of us were minnows. If everyone is special, then no one is. Participation trophies. If we all win, then really we all lose. There has to be losers for there to be winners. Do you find yourself needing someone to lose in order to validate your win? Do you need losers in order to make yourself feel like a winner? Do you need hell in order to make heaven all that more special? See, this is what's called a zero-sum game. In order to gain something, something has to be lost. In order to win, Someone has to lose. If everyone is special, a special and beautiful unique snowflake, then no one is. Okay, if you believe the logic is true and holds true for that statement, well then it must necessarily hold equally as true for its negation. If everyone is special, then no one is. So, what if everyone's utter shit? If everyone's utter shite, well then no one is. If everyone is lacking, incomplete, imperfect, then no one is. A teleology, mother lovers. See, everyone is king when there's no one left to pawn. And so you see, I'm willing to go so far as to argue that anarchy as a political philosophy and ethical practice begin to mirror feminism and particularly care-based ethics as a personal ethical theory. Because the value of a person always lay in their potential for importance to you. Everyone can potentially become important to you, which means at the very least, sure, not everyone is special to you right now, but they could be. And so with care-based ethics, you give the courtesy to all of at the very least recognizing that potential for importance. What I mean is to live in such a way that there is no hierarchy of human value and worth. That all, all lives do in fact matter. And if you recognize that idealistic potential, then there is always potential for it to be actualized. Which means, well, if everyone has even just the potential to matter, if everyone has even just the potential to be special, even if just to you, then everyone has an inherent specialness. It's like energy. It cannot be created or destroyed. It only changes form from potential or stored to actual or kinetic. It's always there. So even just the potential for someone to have meaning and value and be special, it means they are. It just hasn't become actualized yet. And in that realization, if everyone could potentially have meaning to you, then that means everyone at least has the potential for actualizing that meaning. In that realization, there is a level of a surrender of control that gives control. Love that comes through consent, through surrender, to love. 
and then you realize you are just as special as everyone is potentially to you. You! You are special! Even if it's just to me. A dumbass who actually believes you have inherent worth just for existing, and I may never actually even meet you. You. You are special to me. And like Mr. Rogers, it's you I like. And you don't have to believe it for it to be true. But the anarchist? Well, the anarchist philosophy and ethics rests on the supposition that all merit essay. When you do away with what can effectively be described as a pyramid scheme called a hierarchy of human value enacted in a government entity, well then, all have worth and all merit the freedom to choose. Not out of coercion and force, but out of consent. Out of freely surrendering to the contract of love. Do you believe you're worth it? And are you worth your voice mattering? Are you worth life and love and freedom? Are you worth it? But what about everybody else? See, one of the objections to anarchy is that without a government, you're forced to rely on others and that that robs you of your autonomy, your ability, your freedom. I don't know if reliance on others is giving them all the power, as much as it's called trust. You ever plan on being in a relationship? Is that reliance on your partner called giving them all the power? Or is it called love? See, maybe utopia, maybe that anarchistic ideal community isn't a place that needs to be found or a thing that needs to be achieved. Maybe that utopia is a state of being. Like being in love. So how do you fall in love? Is it something you choose or something that happens to you? And how do you love others? How do you personally fall in love? Meaning how do you find yourself being loved? And how do you personally love others? Meaning how do you find yourself loving others? What does love look like to you? A perfect utopia or something that's still evolving here's my question though is it possible to be in love well then what about that utopia you see it's wrong if the system or the government entity makes those choices for you so why not work to make a system you choose to follow and you're able to do so freely and this is where we have to do the really difficult work, wrestling with figuring out just what that system is. See, once you choose to love, to care, and have compassion for your fellow man, once you recognize how big the world is and how many people are in it for you to love and care for, I think you're faced with one of two options. One of the options, the one road, leads to you choosing to see government as an aid, an assistant that helps you in your quest to care for all. I think that's called big government in your mind. The second road, well that's when you realize that this is a huge task to undertake and if we're going to do this, care and love, compassion and charity for all, it needs to be entirely in our hands to do so. We cannot trust some disconnected establishment with both the power and the means of genuinely loving and caring for all. That there's no reason to entrust the government with what we can do on a small scale, to and with those around us. This road leads to de-establishment, deconstruction, the disbandment of government entirely, as there's no need for it. And I think that's called anarchy in your mind. But that, that's the choice you're really faced with when you make care and compassion, when you make love your ethics and your beliefs. You work to build a government that meets your needs in caring and loving for all and works to do what you can't in caring and loving for all, that meets the needs of all those that you can't personally meet yourself. Or we disband government entirely and form close communities of care where we the people 
are truly in charge of meeting needs. We the people are truly consenting to the practices we abide by and follow. We the people are both actually free and able, but more than that, we're willing and loving. Personally, I don't like the fallacy of either ors, and I believe there's a way to do both. That is, to be both involved with the state, sort of, kind of, but disengaged entirely from it. I believe there's a way to live practically, but with the ideal as a roadmap and goal, both means and end. To me, that's called living pragmatically. It may also be very Hegelian in philosophical circles and discourse. It's the synthesis between two contradictory statements that seemingly cannot both be true. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis. But that might just be because my kingdom is not of this world. Part three, the breaking of bread. Before I get into the biblical support for anarchy, not just being a call for Christians to be radically against any sort of hierarchy of human value, no matter what form it takes, but also quite possibly radically disengaged from all earthly governments as they exist. I want to posit that I believe that the Christological Eschatos Kingdom, the Kingdom of Heaven here on Earth, might very well be, at the very least, a framework for the solution to both the anarchist ideal and the anarchistic ethics and philosophies in practical action. They devoted themselves to the Apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All were together and had everything in common. They sold all their possessions and goods and gave to anyone as was needed. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Now, if you weren't raised in the Christian church, or aren't familiar at all with Christianity, or maybe you are, but have never heard those verses because they're conveniently not taught by your mega church, then you probably are wondering whether those are from some communist utopian fiction. In reality, that's from Acts 2, 42 through 46. Now, I could discuss verse 45, specifically the whole they sold their personal property and possessions and shared them with all as anyone might have needed, and how that sounds dangerously close to from each according to their unequal ability to each according to their unequal need. Maybe I'll save that for another video, including where God killed Ananias and Sapphira for not doing this very thing, and in fact, valuing their personal property over caring for others. I will say though that the all here that they shared with wasn't all that put into the pot. And it wasn't all the believers, just the believers. All here isn't just all believers and church members. All is the Greek word pas that literally means all, everyone. If you had an unopened bag of Skittles and I told you to give me all the Skittles, would you assume I meant give me one of each flavor or a portion? or that I'm demanding every Skittle in the bag. No, you know that I mean every single individual Skittle in the bag. That's what a bunch of Christians misinterpret, maybe even deliberately, when it comes to the Greek word pas, or all, and that'll come into play later. Instead, I want to focus on this part. They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. Breaking bread isn't just the symbolic reference to the Eucharist or to communion, something I'll be getting into in a later video titled Giving Thanks and Letting It Kill You. But sharing bread is sharing in fellowship, in communion, in commune. Sharing bread signifies unity and connection with others, reflecting the idea of sharing a meal as a way to build community. Bread is seen as a basic necessity for life, representing God's provision and the importance of ensuring everyone has enough to eat. It's gathering together over sustenance, shared meals, emphasizing equality, fellowship, and mutual care. Bread, central to this act, symbolized sustenance, unity, and divine provision. Echoing the Eucharist where Christ's body is broken for all. 
and by doing so, breaking down barriers of status or hierarchy. See, the early church made this part of their liturgy and religious practice. Shared meals, community, breaking bread, but doing it together in a way where no one was above anybody else. In fact, some of the earliest conflicts within the church came from not sharing what you have. See Acts 4.32 through Acts 5.11. Peter Kropotkin wrote a pretty well-known book called The Conquest of Bread. It was a collection of essays. Kropotkin's Conquest of Bread conveys the idea that access to basic needs, particularly food, is a fundamental right, and that should be guaranteed for all individuals. You see, bread represents a symbol. A symbol of the idea that humanity has the resources to provide for everyone, but a small minority of people monopolize them. Bread is not just food. It's a metaphor for the necessity of sharing abundance and solidarity. It's interesting then to go back and read those passages in Acts with these thoughts in mind. Bread is pretty symbolic to anarchists for this reason, and if you've been on the YouTubes long enough, you know that leftist videos have come to even be classified as bread tube. But maybe you haven't been constantly online. So I'll just say there's been a number of various ideas thrown around for what anarchist communities should be and look like. EJ over at Non-Compete has a series I used to show my college ethics students, in fact. It's one of my favorites because of its practicality and thorough deconstruction. And if it's still there, I'll link it in the description below. Anyway, Kropotkin himself had this notion of federalized communities, and this has been slightly updated by the likes of those such as GDH Cole in the mid-century talking about guild socialism, basically how you organize a complex modern industrial society via worker control. But What's interesting about early Christian and church history is that you've got this sort of transcendent model of this collective community, existing and continuing regardless of culture and country, or state, if you will. It adapts. It doesn't marry to the culture and the state it finds itself in. Jesus telling Pilate that his kingdom is not of this world is an overt testament to this point. And when you look at not only the description of the kingdom, but of how the early church operated, it was in fact a perfect example of these federated communities, able to adapt and continue no matter how the culture or government changed. In fact, this very adaptability has been emphasized as the very, and possibly sole, reason the early church continued on rather than dying out. There was contention in the early church about practices and requirements to be a Christian and be part of the club, eating kosher, circumcision, etc. There were some that believed you could not be a Christian or part of the church unless you were circumcised. One of my favorite verses of the Bible has Paul denounced these individuals, literally saying that if anyone tells you you have to be circumcised to be a Christian, he wishes those men would go all the way and cut it all off. Don't just stop by snipping the tip. They should take the whole thing off of themselves. It's true. Look it up. Anyway, the argument is that it was the Church of Antioch, not the Church of Jerusalem, that allowed Christianity to continue. And it was precisely because it wasn't restrictive and it was able to adapt. Leo Tolstoy put it plainly when he said, Christianity, with its doctrine of humility, of forgiveness, of love, is incompatible with the state, any state, nation, with its haughtiness, its violence, its punishment, and its wars. If anything, the overall message is not to get involved at all with anything political. It's to disavow any political side. After all, my kingdom is not of this world. There is no justification for earthly kingdoms, states, etc., because the only kingdom that matters is the one not of this world. And the second you focus on the polis, which is the Greek word for politics, the second you focus on the politics and government of this world, which come and go, rise and fall like Rome, well then you stop seeking the kingdom, which is the very thing Jesus commands us to look for and seek first. 
basically, a message of love contrasts to anything in a hierarchy, and a kingdom of love will always clash with a kingdom of force. And all kingdoms, governments, state entities of this earth are, by design, kingdoms of force. Failing to do so is exactly the point that many church historians argue was the downfall of Christianity. During the beginning of the Christian religion, the church body itself existed radically independent from the Roman state. They did not involve themselves in the polis or politics of the state, and instead focused on sharing a message of radical love that was not of this world. In fact, this was directly undermining the state itself. See, when Roman soldiers would become believers, they would not continue in military service because, as Tolstoy said, they found that service incompatible to what their new beliefs called them into. Tax collectors, public officials, could not serve anymore as that service and funding ran in opposition to the radical love and charity they found themselves now believing in and part of. So they dropped their post and sold all their possessions. This undermines the military, the economy, and the government itself. They didn't serve in these positions and offices as Christians. Instead, they stopped serving entirely because they were Christians. Christians even refused to serve in the military because it was a call to violence that went against their beliefs. In fact, it was part of the early church requirements in the first few centuries that you cannot be a Christian and be involved in politics of any kind, including military service. If you were, you couldn't partake of the sacraments, like communion or the Eucharist, until you had forfeit your worship of political, worldly, power and involvement. And this is what many theologians and Christian historians point to as the real reason for persecution. It wasn't about religion and the early church not practicing the same religion and worship of Caesar as God. It wasn't religious persecution. It was political. The early church was a great threat to the state of Rome because it eroded it from within, not by directly attacking. It should also be noted, though, that the early church didn't try to change it directly. Well, that is, until Christianity became the official religion of Rome. See, then, well, then you could serve in the military and the atrocities committed could be justified because you were a Christian. You could serve in political office and justify your actions for the same reason. You could be a shrewd businessman and economist, but it's okay because you attend church regularly. When Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire, the church compromised its integrity, adopting the structures and values of the state. This marriage diluted its spiritual mission and led to corruption and institutionalization. Well, if we're a government run by Christian values, then everything will be all right. Incorrect. The two are not compatible at all. And I really hope that the values Christ promoted make that clear. But if not, I'm reluctantly happy to elaborate that in a further discussion. The point here is this one. One of the contentions the anarchist lobs at Christians and thus rejects Christians from being and joining the anarchist community or from anarchists being Christians is the kingdom of heaven. The very prayer Jesus said we should pray is one petitioning the kingdom come here on earth, not just some paradise we wait for once we die. Jesus preached not himself, but the kingdom, and preached it here and now. And that our ethical requirements, our ethics ought to be to seek it first, as in it's already here. With the promise, though, that we will find it if we do seek it. Christians aren't to avoid the earth. We're to establish and live out the kingdom here and now. But that's the rub. A kingdom. And a kingdom without a king is just dumb. 
A kingdom requires a king. A kingdom has a hierarchy. And you can't be an anarchist willingly choosing to live in a hierarchy. You can't be an anarchist and live a life devoted to a king. Right? I believe there's been misinterpretation of the biblical language for far too long when it comes to understanding our relationship with God. Not just as Christians, but as humans. And in part four of this video, I'll discuss that further and hopefully all will finally be clear. But I believe Christians are called to devote themselves to the breaking of bread. Sure, you can argue against the unification of anarchism and Christianity by pointing to the kingdom of heaven. But even Jesus talks of this kingdom as this metaphysical transcendent kingdom. Furthermore, the fact that it exists in this metaphysical transcendent state is used to undermine the kingdoms, the governments, the polis, and the politics of this world. There's no justification for government because the only state that matters is the state of the kingdom of heaven, which isn't an earthly state or government. In that regard and understanding, there ought to, at the very least, be the allowance of compatibility between anarchists and Christians. To live in the world here and now in the manner striving for the same thing, existing the same way, just with differences. And isn't that part of the point? A lack of hierarchy does not equate to uniformity. And at the most, the possibility that this metaphysical kingdom of heaven, here and now, when done right, serves as the ideal for understanding a potential framework for the communities to exist in total consent to all individuals following an ethics of love with the requirements and responsibilities, as well as freedoms that that provides where we all drink wine and break bread together at this sort of anarchist communion table in an anarchist kingdom where you're not forced to believe in a king or the king or hail the king. All hail the king, baby. Oh. Because the only king is love. Love is king. And when we break bread together and eat it, every time we break bread together and eat of it, we do so in love, taking love into us, becoming kings. You should see me in a crown. You should see me in a crown. Part four, the king is dead. Long live anarchy. I began this video with a Bible verse from Judges 21, verse 25. In those days, there was no king. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. I grew up believing that the unstated follow-up to this was, and this was bad, and lots of wrongs were committed because everyone was just doing what was right in their own eyes. When in reality, the book of Judges establishes that there was no king, no hierarchy, no government officials, but instead there were those that would reveal the law, that would remind what the law said, and then if an issue arose, they would judge, yaka in the Hebrew, if there was a violation and what to do. My point is, when those judges themselves became like a governing body, we not only have it described what they become in 1 Samuel 8 verses 3, they turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. We then get a pretty solid description of just what an earthly government will be like by God to the prophet Samuel and told that that's what he's supposed to directly tell the people. 1 Samuel 8 verses 6 through 18. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel the prophet. 
So he prayed to God, and the Lord told him, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me, as they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly, and let them know what a king who will reign over them will do. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king, for government. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will do. This is what government will do. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cook and bake. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants, your men servants and maid servants, and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen. And here's the warning. The Lord will not answer you in that day. Just substitute king, he, him, all of that for government. And you get the idea. When did the God of Israel start referring to himself as king? See, it was initially very tribal. You are my people and that's it. It wasn't the relationship that changed, it was merely the language that has changed to match the people's desire and give a wider perspective. You, you want a king? Okay, well then just think of me as your king. The way the world does it is wrong and bad with its government and such, but if that's what you want, then, then just refer to me as that for you. If it helps you understand me as the thing you desire, but that's not my mindset. You're just simply my people, and I'm yours. But if this language helps you, then think of me as your king, or think of me as your father, or think of me as your bridegroom, whatever. These labels aren't the point. The point is, you're my people, and I'm yours. The God of Israel declared that he and he alone would be Israel's head. Yet this was not a theocracy. For God had no representative on earth, and tribal assemblies made the decisions. It was the people who wanted a king, and only so they could be like other nations. They were attracted to a centralized state. And so God granted their request, but also included the consequences of having that worldly, centralized state as well. God tells the Israelites that if they appoint a king, that king will exploit them and mistreat them and take advantage of them. Any government will. And still the people are like, LOL, but kings and crowns though. And so God gives them what they want. 1 Samuel 9 covers the anointing of Saul. And on we go. I think there is an argument then that state power, the power of the monarch, is granted almost unwillingly by God. Given to a self-destructive people, not because it's in their best interest, but it's in the name of respecting their autonomy. Their right to make decisions, even and especially bad decisions. The monarch is explicitly made part of the trajectory that God had sin and death. It's one of the consequences of the fall of humanity. God tells the Israelites that it's it's going to be bad for them, and they make the decision to do it anyway. And so we get a record in the Old Testament of good kings, of, of, of great kings, of bad kings. Why? Because the whole story is worth telling to show how severe the Bible is, even on the great kings. 
We can say that in the biblical accounts, the good kings are always defeated by Israel's enemies, and the great kings are actually the bad ones. Why? Because they won victories and extended their borders, but did so... not so good. Good meant they were just kings that they did not abuse their power, and that they worshipped the true God of Israel. Bad meant that they promoted idolatry, they rejected God, and were also unjust and wicked. Great meant they were bad, but at least the nation of Israel was successful and prosperous. Sounds a little like modern times, right? And see, the whole point of keeping the account is to show that it doesn't matter whether the kings were righteous, the goodness of the kingdom itself wasn't based on the king being righteous or wicked, but instead on the existence of the earthly kingdom itself. The point is that the texts are treated as a revelation of the God of Israel who has presented himself an enemy of the earthly royal power and the state. There's also this relationship between kings and prophets. Basically, the Hebrew Bible has kings and prophets, and kings are bad and prophets are good. These prophets weren't advisors to the kings. They were severe critics, and the word they brought was always in opposition to royal power. Kings are symbols of self-destructive, willful humanity, and prophets exist outside that system as symbols of truth to power and of what's actually real. The prophets of the Old Testament aren't part of the state hierarchy or part of any institutional structure. They are raised up by God from among the people, organically. And they are anti-establishment, criticizing the monarchs for their various debaucheries. God warned the people about the dangers of kings and sent prophets to do the same. Because God is himself an enemy of royal power and the state. Hell, just look at Ecclesiastes, or the Kohelet, which was written supposedly by the work of the great and wise King Solomon. This book seriously challenges political power, even when it instructs to obey the king. What did the author say about any legal judicial system established by mankind? Check out Ecclesiastes 3.16. The author also sees the evil that there is in what we would now call bureaucracy, which is a child of hierarchy, in Ecclesiastes 5, 8 through 9. Or what was said in Ecclesiastes 9, after talking about following the king. Point is, what we get in the stories of the Old Testament are something of a warning and its consequences. What happens when the people of God get too invested in becoming a nation and world power? What happens when people lose sight of what really matters, of taking care of each other, of taking care of the immigrants, of caring and loving all? After all, Later stated in the biblical text is that love is the summation of the entirety of the law. And what happens when you forget love? Through love, you heard him? You could not ask for a more noble cause than that. Well, that's just the Old Testament. Okay, on to Jesus. In Luke 4, when Jesus is tempted by the devil in the wilderness to be given dominion over all the governments of the earth, Jesus is told by the devil that all those government and institutions and state and political powers have been, quote, handed over to me, the devil, and I, the devil, give them to whomever I, the devil, wish to give them. And when the devil says this, Jesus doesn't rebuke the devil and say, No! All authority belongs to God and, uh, and comes from God the Father and God chooses who's in charge. No. Jesus quotes scripture again and basically draws attention to the devil's temptation. The devil says, Worship me and it, political power, will be yours as if to say it is, in fact, the worship of the devil that is what gives political power. Or perhaps seeking political power or involvement in anything with the state or government is, in effect, worshiping the devil. 
And Jesus rebukes this saying that we're not to concern ourselves with the desire for political power, what worship the devil gives us, but we're to worship God alone. Okay, so, but what about surrendering to Caesars? What's Caesars? Cool, yeah, sure. What is Caesars? In those days, it was anything with his face on it. It's kind of like cattle branding. Anything with a mark was the only way in which ownership was recognized. Everyone had their own mark in those days. The head of Caesar on the coin was more than a decoration or mark of honor. It signified that all the money in circulation in the empire belonged to Caesar. When an emperor died, the likeness changed on the coinage. Caesar owned all currency. All money belonged to Caesar. And if you wanted, you could simply confiscate it. With the answer Jesus gave to the question of surrendering to Caesar what's Caesar's, he does not say that taxes are lawful. He does not counsel obedience to the Romans. He looks and asks, what really belongs to Caesar? Whatever bears his mark. But here is the basis and limit of Caesar's power. Wherever this mark is, and where is it? Money. Public documents concerning the political issues and on certain altars. That's it. On the other hand, whatever does not bear Caesar's mark does not belong to him. Therefore, you don't surrender those things. So what doesn't bear the mark of Caesar? What doesn't bear his brand? And how does that question carry over to modern times? Well, what bears the mark of our current political system? What currently bears the mark of political power and of the state? Well, anything that does ought to be surrendered to the state. And we're called not to seek those things, but instead seek the kingdom, which is not in those things. For those belong to the state. And the state, you could argue, belongs to the devil. Judicially speaking, Jesus held no value in the justice system. Yes, the legal justice system of his time or any times. And in fact, was rebuked and hit for his lack of respect. He was even called out for not regarding people's hierarchical positions. Like in Matthew 22:16, they said to him, you speak without worrying about what will be. To Jesus, human life transcends all the laws that try to organize society into positions of power and value. The books, the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are full of stories of clashes between Jesus and the authorities because he violated the law out of concern for individual lives. He rebuked his followers when they asked who would be closest to him in heaven, rebuking their desire for a hierarchy. He spoke throughout Matthew 10 about actively living as failures in this world, that his true followers were the ones that any system of hierarchy, be it political or the church, would reject and kick out. The kingdom is a kingdom of losers, of the incomplete, Furthermore, he spoke out against any form of hierarchy, including family. You must hate your father and mother if you wish to follow me. That didn't mean to actually hate them. It was a call to do away with what the titles of father and mother represented hierarchically. One of my favorite passages is when he discusses what should be your response when you're slapped. This often gets misinterpreted without the cultural context of the time, so allow me to explain. See, Jesus tells his followers, when you're slapped, turn the other cheek, as if, do it again. But what you fail to understand without the cultural context is back then, there were two ways you slapped people. You slapped someone as an equal or as an inferior. Front hand, back hand! Now, when Jesus said, turn the other cheek, what he was inferring was, when someone hits you as an inferior, you turn the other cheek you allow yourself to be hit again, but you are informing them, if you're gonna hit me, hit me as an equal, not an inferior. What do you think this does to anyone who believes that they have power 
and value more than someone else. You think it pissed him off more? I mentioned briefly that when Jesus was asked who would sit directly to either side of him when his kingdom is established and comes, that Jesus rebukes this question. Why? Why the rebuke? Because his call is to not do things as they are usually done in a worldly society or culture. To not continue to do things that way, but instead create another society on another foundation. Now in this point, I think one might rightly posit that setting up independent or anarchic communities outside of political power was relatively easy in the days of Jesus, but is no longer possible today. I get it, but I think it's hardly enough to convince that instead we may and must engage in the politics and try to change the system. Those very systems which are always a means of conquering others, of exercising power over others, of consistently othering people, making others. There's us and then there's them. I think the point is not merely a paradigm shift where you change perspectives, but rather a paradigm expansion. To not limit your focus and instead see things from a wider lens. All things. To not look at it as us versus them, but all of us. Including all structures. To be kingdom minded. Jesus himself used the kingdom of heaven to rebuke earthly kingdoms and specifically said so to Pilate when on trial, saying, my kingdom is not of this world. As such, just because a spiritual kingdom exists doesn't negate anarchy. In fact, I believe it supports it in a world present here and now focused view. Specifically, it's saying there's no justification for any earthly government or state or political power and condemns all forms of them, which is exactly what the theory of anarchy itself states. It simply supports this by pointing to a transcendent kingdom as if to say you cannot be citizens of two kingdoms, meaning if you follow and live one, you cannot live the other. Choose for today whom you will serve. Earthly governments that ebb and flow and rise and fall with time and change presidencies or not, or a spiritual transcendent kingdom that does not fade. And if you are a citizen of this kingdom, well then you cannot be a citizen in this kingdom or get involved in any of the political affairs, including something so simple as voting maybe. Just like, hey, I can't become president of a country I'm not a citizen of, nor can I vote in any election of a country I'm not a citizen of. So when it comes to Jesus alone, I suppose that you have to ask yourself, who are you going to choose today whom you shall serve? Romans 3.28 states, there is neither Jew nor Greek, which is basically saying believer or unbeliever, or like theist or atheist, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. That's pretty anti-hierarchical itself. Any sort of divisions you can make are done away with. But it's here we finally arrive at the passages in the epistles that are all too often quoted when it comes to surrendering or abiding by the authority. Oddly enough, these passages are ignored when it's not your political party in charge, when it's hashtag not your president. Anyway, we first have to fix the general Christian climate in order to put the verses in context. Although these are well known, I'm going to read them out. First, we have Romans 13, 1 through 7. Let every person be subject to the higher authorities, for there is no authority which does not come from God, and the authorities that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, the one who resists authority resists the order that God has established, and those who resist will bring condemnation on themselves. It is not for good conduct, but for bad that magistrates are to be feared. The magistrate is the servant of God 
for your good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for it is not in vain that he bears the sword, being the servant of God to exercise vengeance and punish those who do evil. It is necessary, therefore, to be subject, not only for fear of punishment, but also for the sake of conscience. It is also for this reason that you pay taxes, for the magistrates are servants of God, attending entirely to this function. Pay to all of them what is their due, taxes to whom you owe taxes, tribute to whom you owe tribute, fear to whom you owe fear, honor to whom you owe honor. We then have Titus 3, 1, remind them to be subject to magistrates and authorities, to obey, and to be ready for any good work. These are the only texts in the whole Bible which stress obedience and duty of obeying authorities. It is true that two other passages show that there are among Christians of the time a counterflow to the main current that I've just talked about. In 2 Peter 2.10, there is condemnation of those who despise authority, and Jude 8 also condemns those who, carried along by their dreamings, despise authority, and revile the glorious ones. Or even 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 2, which says, Therefore I exhort that, above all things, make prayers, supplications, petitions, and thanksgivings for all humans, for kings, and for all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceable and quiet life in all reverence and honesty. We must emphasize, however, that these are very ambiguous texts. After all, what is the authority? quote unquote, that they have in view. And we must never forget the constant reminder that all authority belongs to God. I bring up those other texts because the texts written by Paul seem to have a trend that differs from the other ones. And because of this, theologically and historically speaking, there's become a seemingly incomprehensible problem. You see, from the 3rd century AD, most theologians have focused solely on the statements of Paul in Romans 13 and have preached total submission to authority. Maybe they just forgot the other texts I read. They have done this without taking into account the context of those statements made in Romans. They have even fixated on one statement in particular. All authority comes from God. This has been the leading theme in 16 centuries of cooperation between church and state. Imperious duty of obeying the power that is from God as though it were itself God. That is, again, unless it's with the party you disagree with and reject, the other team, if you will. Hashtag not my president. Personally, I've always found it interesting to see how theologians have fared when they had to explain things like tyrants or dictators. What has history shown? Well, the religious leaders and theologians adopted a loophole to explain that power comes from God only when it is gained in a legal, legitimate, and peaceful way, and exercised in a moral and righteous way. But this did not call into question the general duty. Even at the time of the Reformation, Luther used this text in the Peasants' War to charge the princes to crush the revolt. As for Calvin, he insisted that kings are legitimate except when they attack the church. So, as long as the authorities let Christians freely practice their religion, they cannot be faulted. As I see it, what we have here is this crazy betrayal of the original Christian view. And the source of this betrayal is undoubtedly the tendency towards conformity and the ease of obeying, all stemming from the original sin of marriage between the church and the Roman state. Regardless of the reason, the only rule that has been gathered from the vast array of texts is that there is no authority except from God. But let's look more into what actually is going on in these passages. First things first, what's the larger context and overall point? In Romans 9 through 11, Paul has just made a detailed study of the relationship dynamic between the Jewish people and Christians. 
a new development then begins which will span from chapters 12 through 14 and at the heart of which is the contentious passage of chapter 13. This lengthy discussion and section begins with the words, do not be conformed to the present age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Paul's general and essential command then is that we should not be conformists, that we should not obey the trends and customs and currents of thought that the society in which we live has formed. We should not submit to the form of them, but that we should be transformed, that we should receive a new form by the renewing of our mind. That is by starting from a new perspective, namely the will of God and love. Well, this is obviously a strange beginning if he's later to demand obedience to political authorities. Paul then goes on to teach at length about love. Love among Christians in the church in chapter 12, verses 3 through 8. Love for all people in chapter 12, verses 9 through 13. And love for enemies, not avenging oneself, but blessing those who persecute you. With a further exhortation to live peaceably with all in chapter 12, verses 14 through 21. The passage on the authorities follows next. Then all the commandments are summed up in the commandment of love and of doing no wrong to others in chapter 13, 8 through 10. In chapter 14, some details are offered as to the practice of love specifically. Hospitality, not judging others, supporting the weak, etc. This then is the general framework or movement within which the passage on authority occurs. Seems rather odd and kind of sort of out of joint in the larger context, so much so that some have thought that it must be an interpolation and that the author of Romans, maybe Paul, did not write it. Personally, I believe that it has its place right exactly here and that it does come from the Apostle. And I want to tell why. See, we've seen that there is a progress of love in the passage from friends to strangers and then to enemies. And then this is where the passage on authority occurs. In other words, we must love our enemies and therefore we must even respect the authorities, not love them as an authority, maybe as a person, not their position. We're not called to love their position, but accept their orders. We have to remember that the authorities have attained to power through God. Yes, we recall that Saul, a mad and bad king in the Old Testament, attained to power through God. This certainly does not mean that he was good or just or lovable. Nevertheless, we love the person and respect the authority, even if they are both enemies. Along the same lines, one of the best commentators on this passage, Romans 13, Alphonse Melo, uh, Melo, M-A-I-L-L-O-T, Melo, relates it directly to the end of chapter 12. Do not let yourself be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let every person, therefore, be subject to the higher authorities. In other words, the author of Romans, let's just say Paul, belongs to that Christian church which at first is unanimously hostile to the state, to the imperial power, to the authorities, and in this text is moderating that hostility. The author is reminding Christians that the authorities are also people. There was no abstract concept of the state. Uh, uh, people such as themselves. and that they must accept and respect them too. At the same time, the author, Paul, shows great restraint in this council. When he tells them to pay their dues, taxes, to whom taxes are due, revenue, to whom revenue is due, respect, to whom respect is due, honor, to whom honor is due, we are rightly reminded of the answer of Jesus regarding that tax. 
as I said before, to surrender to Caesars what has his face on it. Far more boldly, Jesus claims that we owe neither respect nor honor to the magistrates or the authorities, simply the surrender of what is theirs. Before I wrap this all up, I think what I just talked about calls for a few points of discussion. The first is just taxes. Christians must not refuse to pay them. That's all. To surrender what is of the state back to the state. All while seeking the kingdom and living out the kingdom, which is, by definition, not belonging to the state. The second, though, might be more striking. We must pray for the authorities. Paul asks that prayer be made for kings, for those in authority, for the government. But what is meant by this? The passage is a call to remember the person, not the position. And to pray for the person, not the position. Paul says, in effect, that we are to pray for all people, included our kings and those in high office. We are to pray even for kings and magistrates. We detest them, but we are still to pray for them. No one must be excluded from our intercession, from our appeal to God's love for them. But it isn't to recognize their power and position in a hierarchy above us, but to treat them as people equal to us, equal in worth, deserving of love. It will not be prayer that they remain in power, that they win victories, that they endure. It will be prayer for their conversion, that they change the way they behave and act, they renounce violence and tyranny, all associated with government, that they become truthful and they realize love and live by it. Third point, and this is where things get a bit woo-woo and metaphysical. Paul tells us that we are to fight against the exousai, E-X-O-U-S-I-A-I in the Greek, enthroned in heaven. Cross-reference that to Ephesians 6.12. It is thought, for example, that the angels are exousai. Oscar Coleman and Gunther Den, D-E-H-N, thus conclude that since the same word is used there, it has to be some relation. In Greek, exousai, which can mean the public authorities, but which is also in the New Testament another meaning, being used for the abstract, metaphysical, woo-woo, spiritual, religious powers. In other words, the New Testament supposes that early political and military authorities really have their basis in an alliance with spiritual powers, whether good or evil. My point is, when Paul in Colossians 2, 13 through 15 says that Jesus has conquered evil and death, he also says that Christ has, quote, stripped of their power all the dominions and authorities and made a public spectacle of them in triumphing over them by the cross. Thus, the mindset should be clear. The crucifixion has led to the total undermining of all powers, whether the spiritual exousi, woo-woo metaphysical stuff, or hearkening directly back to the devil's temptation in the wilderness. Earthly powers or spiritual powers, Christ has undermined all of them on the cross, done away with all of them. What does this mean? It means the very belief system that Christians ascribe to, Christ and the cross, that very belief system convey the very essence of anarchy. The cross as the Christological symbol of love itself, it destroys any justification for governments, powers, and hierarchies. The cross is anarchy. After all, no gods, no masters. And the cross is that. The cross is where God kills God. And this is the very heart of the biggest misinterpretation by both Christians and non-Christians alike in assuming that the existence of God entails a master-subject dynamic. I would say that everything Jesus preached in the Gospels and everything that was preached about Jesus in the epistles points to that not being the case. See, I don't know God at all as supreme master. God, 
at least the God whom Jesus calls Father, and whom he tells us to call Father, is never presented to us as a master who imposes his will on us or who regards us as inferiors. Jesus is called the image of the invisible God in Colossians. And while in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I and the Father are one, he in me and I in him, Philippians also addresses this dynamic in chapter 2, saying that Jesus did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but instead took on the lowest form, and that we're to do the same to be God, but not think of ourselves in a hierarchical value system like that. Instead, to go to the lowest. Why? Because if we're all low, if we're all low, then no one is low. If everyone is utter shite, then no one is. If everyone is lacking, incomplete, then no one is. Everyone is king when there's no one left a pawn. And if Jesus is God, and God became the lowest, then God is a God who destroys that very hierarchy by turning it on its head. And that's where we meet this God, outside of a hierarchy, in a relationship of love. In the epistles of John, God is directly called love. God is love, it says. That's a mathematical equivalence. X equals Y, God equals love. And love is anarchy. I'll stop short of reminding you of the transitive property, which is if X equals Y and Y equals Z, then X equals... But the point is this. I don't need you to believe in God. I just need you to believe in a thing called love. Just listen to the rhythm of the heart! Where we go from there, I don't know, but I'd love to work it out with you and figure it out together. Maybe over some wine and breaking of bread. So join me. Let's drink some wine. Let's break some bread. Let's do it together. And the world will be better for this and for you in it. Thanks so much for watching. I'd really appreciate if you helped out my channel by doing all the things that the YouTube algorithm loves to be done with videos. You know, like comment, share, drop me a like. If you're new or haven't done so yet, I'd love for you to subscribe for more content. And hey, consider supporting me and my family on Patreon. There's a Discord server over there, unedited content, and I think it just serves as a decent outlet, at least for the time being, for the community I'm hoping to build across all platforms, boundaries, and borders. I hope to see you there and to get to know you better. Either way, have a wonderful day and just know how much your life matters.